This is Julie Pearson Little Thunder with the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program at Oklahoma State University. Today is Monday, May 20th, 2019, and I'm interviewing Rosalind Cook in Denver, Colorado, uh, in Arvada. Rosalind, you're a nationally known sculpture, sculptor who excels at capturing faces and movement, and you're especially beloved in Tulsa, which was your home base for many years before you moved to Crested Butte, Colorado. Your work ranges from tabletop size to monumental, and you currently have a show at the Crested Butte Art Center coming up this summer. I'm hoping we can explore some subjects from your biography, as well as some new areas. Thank you for taking the time to talk with me. Great. Glad to be here. Uh, tell me a little about where you were born and spent your first seven years. I was born in Lima, Peru. My parents are American. My dad was a rancher and uh, spent my first seven years there. So uh, we lived in a little village high up in the mountains. There was uh, no stores, anything. We were forced into creativity, making <laughs> our toys, kites. And uh, the Inca culture has really um, had an impact on me. Just the uh, wonder, my, the uh, appreciation for different cultures, different traditions, um, facial structures, those kind of things. Um, I've always been drawn to Native Americans or South Americans, uh, that kind of work. You, and your father was in charge of the ranch operations for a mining company. Um, I wonder how he might have influenced your art or your interests, other interests, as you grew up? My dad. Mm -hmm. Oh, my dad was a wonderful, wonderful man. I, I actually did a sculpture of him on his horse, which I hope you will look at later. Uh, he was an outdoors person. We were fishing. We fished a lot. We uh, hiked a lot. We climbed mountains. We lived above the timber line, so it was all rocky. Um, yeah, we lived about 13,000 feet in the mountains, but we were all outdoor people. My dad had no prejudices whatsoever. He was so accepting and loving of all the people, and even down to the shepherds that worked the sheep at the ranch. Uh, so I think he instilled the love of indigenous people in me early on. And how about your mother? How did she impact your art or your My views? mom is quite artistic, actually. My grandmother painted, my mom painted. Uh, she lived in a generation where women didn't just move out and excel in art. She was a school teacher. Mm -hmm. And she also had to pay for our braces and camp and things like that. And, you know, I think I gave myself permission to become an artist. I don't think that she, in her generation, could give herself permission or she would have greatly excelled. You know, you tell a story in uh, the biography, the photo essay, uh, Capturing the Spirit, about finding this little rock and, and you say, look, Mom, it's Mary holding baby Jesus. Oh, I forgot and about that story. That's yeah, such a telling on. story, yes. Number one, because that shows a budding sculptor, right? They, they're seeing these expressive Shapes forms. And, mm -hmm. But I'm also interested in that because um, there's a lot of iconography, uh, religious iconography, that when it combines with Native traditions, you see those kinds of subject matter. And I'm wondering... Yeah. what your exposure was to the native art there in, or was it Arroyo? Arroyo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Arroyo. Arroyo. Uh, yeah, I was only about two and a half, and we had this whole driveway full of gravel rocks. And uh, I still have that old rock. My mom had it put in a little glass dome. And she said, how could you, out of all the rocks that you saw, here comes, here comes Mary holding baby Jesus, and it's quite abstract. And it's funny because I'm playing around now with uh, Fauvism, abstract, more abstract painting. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think uh, the Catholic, the Catholic and the Inca traditions married 
down there, but we saw a lot of Virgin Marys around. And uh, so, of course, as a little child, that's what I keyed in on. But I do a lot of liturgical work now, you know, and it's just a part of my, what I'm drawn to. And do you have memories of some of the artworks that you saw in Arroyo? Oh yeah, even as poor, poor, poor as that area was, you would walk in a Catholic church and it would have gold gilt, it would have exquisite candlesticks, it would have a statuary that was just breathtaking, like museum quality, and yet the people are poor, poor. And, you know, I didn't realize the contrast back then, but boy, I did as an adult going back and, and seeing the poverty all around and yet the church. But in a way, I think the deification is important to poor people because it gives them, it lifts their spirit. And in fact, that's why I say my purpose of my work is to lift the human spirit. And uh, I, I don't criticize that dichotomy at all. I, I see a deep need for it, actually. What is your earliest memory of seeing what you would define as art? What's your very earliest memory? Probably as a little child in the Catholic Church. And then when we came back to the States, uh, my mom would she would always point out how, the beauty of things. She forced me or drew me into looking at nature and the perfect composition of a tree or rock formation. Um, that's art and that's really the, I would say all good sculpture, all good painting has its roots in good composition. Where do you find perfect composition but in nature? What is your earliest memory of making art? Elementary school. And it was boring. I look back now and it was, you know, it was so, looking at what kids do in art classes now. I, I was in a little bitty town in South Texas, but I loved, loved art class. You know, in fact, I wanted to major in art, but my father said, uh, no way, Jose, because I'm paying for four years of college and you better pick something you can uh, make a living at. So I majored in special ed and taught blind children, which also, it was funny, I would make bed, I'd go to Pier 1 and get bedspreads and make skirts and, and caftans and things that had a lot of texture because my children love texture. And I, all of that's gone into my sculpting. Well, absolutely. I mean, I think even special ed, whether you were consciously aware of it or not, was sort of an invitation to bring art oh, yeah. totally into the lives of, of these children. Did you see, because um, that movie about Helen Keller came out in the 60s, did yes. you see that? I've seen like three movies on Helen Keller. Was that partially you know. an, an influence in your choosing that particular form of I, You know, I guess growing up too, we would see in Peru, especially in poverty areas, you see children with special needs and there's no help for them. Mm. And I've always been drawn to the down and outers or the people who are struggling. Mm -hmm. I have a, I think God put in me a compassion. And then I love to see them overcome mm -hmm. and to learn and to do what they've been told they can't do. So, yeah, I, I'm very blessed in that area. Well, I want to backtrack just a bit because um, yes I had read that both your mother and grandmother took you to their painting classes and I'm yeah. wondering when you're sitting in those classes are you observing what they're doing are you kind of painting yourself what's going oh, well, on they would pay for me to have a little tuition and I'd paint too okay you know but uh, probably not really until I was about 12 did I start playing around in classes. And then I always painted in the garage. I mean, I had things going. 
but I never was a very good painter. So after I had my three children, uh, well, when I was pregnant with my first, I took a sculpting class because I was, had to quit teaching. And I was just bored out of my mind and took a sculpting class and it was like, this is who I am working three dimensionally. And it's funny, I can't draw a face worth a flip, but give me some clay and I've got the bone structure, I've got the joy or the sadness or, I, it just is magic for me, working three dimensionally. You can, um, you can reproduce that. Um, well, that was your first time when you're introduced to this professional sculptor, Octavio uh -huh. Medellin, right? He has uh -huh. this foundry in his studio. Uh -huh. You've never been in a sculpting studio before. No, I never have. I what, never. Was your, what are your memories of that? We worked in terracotta clay, and uh, he was he was from Mexico, and he had a little studio and home in an old part of Oak Cliff, Dallas. And uh, we actually did our first bronze casting in these metal pots in the ground. But um, he was he was limitless, and he encouraged us to move, not to be realistic but that reality was a point of departure. And um, I worked in terracotta clay, and what was so wonderful, of course then you have to keep it sprayed and wet, mm -hmm. but it was so malleable in my hands, and it would move where I wanted it to, but then it also had a mind of its own. And that, you know, that's when I'm sculpting, I start with a preconceived idea, but then as I start working, it goes in its own way. Right. Uh-huh. So gets me excited just talking about it. <laughs> yeah. So did you actually try, did you actually cast a bronze when you were working? I did. When you were studying with him? And okay. guess what it was? It was an abstract Madonna. <laughs> so, <laughs> that you know, it was sense. very smooth, very abstract. In fact, there was no face. It was concave. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know. It makes perfect mm -hmm. sense. And he was, he took a more expressionistic approach to yes. sculpture. So yeah. you were being exposed to that there. Mm -hmm. And I just want to quickly mention that you ended up there uh, because how you and Hal had gotten married and had moved to Texas. And yes. You ended up there. How long did you study with um, Octavio before you uh, moved to Tulsa? Only about a year and a half I was there. Yeah. And, and then, actually and you, then had, you know, I started having babies yes, and there's say. no time, mm -hmm. time to sculpt. Right. So as they got a little older, um, I still was working terracotta clay. Hal fixed uh, 220 up in our garage. I had an old used kiln and I started doing people's dogs and children just in the neighborhood, in right? In the neighborhood, just as a hobby. And uh, I would even get paid sometimes. And so that's sort of where it was as the children were getting older and less dependent on me. So uh, in 1989, I took a formal sculpting class with Glenna Goodacre at Scottsdale Artist School. And we used a plastiline, not a water-based, but an oil-based clay, uh, aluminum uh, armatures. And I just, I just knew this is what I was meant to do. And I dove in and I have an incredible husband who said he just wanted me to be happy. <laughs> and he supported me and he was a great cheerleader. I began to go to workshops week-long workshops and he'd keep the kids. And then uh, when I was 42, which was I think in 90, 18, uh, 1990, I entered my first show and I sold all three pieces and I got picked up by a couple of galleries that had come to the show and that was the beginning and then I had to go back and take anatomy, fill in some of the empty holes. Um, in a way, I'm glad I didn't go to 
formal college art school because I probably would have been doing barbed wire and paper mache and I would have gone a whole different track. Uh -huh. um, I started with classical training and, and then I can depart from that. Mm -hmm. And I think you can see the classical aspects of my sculpture, but then you can also see how they depart from that. Well, um, I want to go back a little bit to your workshop with Glenna um, Goodacre, and and she was the one who took you aside, right? And what did mm -hmm. she tell you during that class? Well, it was at the almost at the end of the week, and and she asked me about how much I sculpted. I said, "Oh, it's just a hobby," and she said, "I think you might want to consider this as more than a hobby," and I went. Well, maybe I will. <laughs> so she saw the promise, but I think she did. And she was told, uh, you know, she did the Vietnam Women's Memorial. Right. She's probably one of the most famous and prolific women sculptors of my era. But she was told in her art class at Texas Tech, you ought to give up sculpting. You'll never amount to anything. So you see, I think that that to me is so sad. Well, and also a reason that women need women mentors sometimes, right? I mean, yeah. when you started out, well, let's talk about her class, for example. Was it predominantly women taking the class from Glenna mm. Goodacre? You know, she was a forerunner. Uh, there weren't many women sculptors at that time. Uh, at that class, I think half were men and half were women. But, um, and I attribute some of my success, the fact that I was a woman doing significant pieces mm -hmm. in the art world, in the realm of sculpting. It was really a man's uh, world, mm -hmm. but there are a few uh, that really excelled. And that's who I would study, and I began to take workshops from people whose works I respected, male or female. Mm -hmm. But I had to have respect for them and their work. Was uh, Hal Dixon, was that one of the, another influential sculptor for you? No. Or? Okay. I'm not sure. Um, Fritz White was okay. someone oh, I yes. took from. Fritz White is, is no longer with us. And he would, he, many people would leave his shops, his workshops in tears. He would come by and say, that looks like hell. Take it off and do it again. And, and you know, he was a stickler for anatomy. And he was a realist pretty much, wasn't yeah. he? Yeah. yeah, and he's done some incredible, he did the uh, uh, Osiaga Indian for Florida State. Mm -hmm. uh, he was an amazing man, but he was, uh, he wasn't warm and fuzzy, I'll put it that way, but I learned so much from him. Well, you know, when you did your, when you entered your first sculptures in this By Women of Women show in 1989, Bank of Oklahoma, uh -huh. how did you know how to price your work? Mm, that's a good question. Well, I talked to the foundry. The foundry cast it for me, uh, and he said, you usually will take uh, your foundry cost, and if there's a commission involved, you up it three times. So you make the same as the foundry, the foundry makes the third, and the commissioner makes the third. So that was the beginning. But then as I got into the business, as my additions begin to sell out, I start them at the lowest price I can. And then they start going up, and the last fourth is goes at a high price. And how about um, deciding on the number in your editions? Are, is that something a mold, that they advise you? A mold will keep its integrity for between 30 and 40 castings, because you're pouring molten wax into the silicone rubber molds. Um, Seldom, except for the U.S. Open 2001 piece, uh, we had to make several molds because we had small ones that were sold to underwrite the life-size ones and, and undersold to underwrite um, 
those that were given to each of the participants at the U.S. Open. So we had seven molds for that piece. But generally, I will price them, I will uh, not price them, but make my molds between 30 and 40, generally. Mm -hmm. If it's a monumental piece, they go maybe five to 15. That makes sense. Um, yeah, and, and often this, you know, the business part of art is the hardest for oh. artists to master. Yeah. And I found it really interesting that your neighbor became your business manager as your career took off. Yeah. Can you talk about that a little? There, there came a point where my success was growing and growing, and I could not be creative. I could either sculpt or work on books and foundry phone calls and managing my business. And it came a point where I was greatly frustrated. And um, my good friend, who is married to a doctor, and I, it, she, has a, she has a brain for numbers. And she is also a tough cookie. And I'm the kind of person that would go, well, we just can't make our payment. And I'd go, well, okay, I'll give you six more months, not Melanie. She was a tough cookie. And I said, Melanie, would you like to work for me uh, three days a week? It ended up being full time. From three days a week, three hours a day to full time. And she, she just took over and would handle the business. She could be mean as a snake when she needed to be. And I'd, I'd be sculpting, I'd listen to her on the phone and I'd go, what? <laughs> and anyway, but that's exactly what I needed. That's what you And we had stayed friends. I remember her husband said, you know what? You're going to lose your friendship if you go to work for her. And you know what? We didn't. We've stayed very, very close. It's because she was good at what she did. I'm good at what I do. And we didn't, we respected each other in that area. Yes, that that's mm -hmm. a wonderful story. Yeah. Um, well, and at this point, I guess you've in your studio, which uh, you've. I wanted to ask you how much you sort of helped design it because you had at one point your studio and a gallery space together. Yes, as I understand it. So. Yeah. So I went from working into a fourteen foot by fourteen foot office. And then I started doing big pieces, life size, in the living room, which had a vaulted ceiling. In your living room. <laughs> yes. Of your house. In Tulsa. And then I said, you know, it's time for my, because my work was in demand. And so I would, I paid for that studio. It was a thousand square foot studio, 14 foot ceilings. The whole back of the wall was a garage door that opened up. I uh, had one whole wall of mirrors, um, and and I mirrors knew, were to be able to see the different angles. Yes, because I would turn my pieces. Even yes. the big ones are on uh, platforms that had casters. Okay. And you, when you look at a piece in a mirror, if one eye is higher than the other, you really see it. Or if the transition of form breaks and you want it, you can see the. It's, I, can't, I can't work without a mirror. But uh, yes, I designed skylights. I designed a work area for Melanie for the office. I designed a rest library area for me so I could refer to my books. I could take a break and not feel like it was in my work area. Then I had a store, huge storage closet for materials and welders and things like that and then i had a small gallery area so it was really wonderful because as people would come i i would have open studios on fridays so i'd have everything from girl scouts to college art classes to homeschoolers uh, and i kept my open studio on friday but then they could see everything from the whole aspect of being an artist and I would be on a ladder scaffolding or working and I'd have three or four pieces going at a time which was interesting uh, 
and I could talk to people, but I never worked on faces and I never worked on hands on Friday because I have to so zone in on those features. I would work on drapery or hair, something, something that was big and fun. And you could be distracted. And I could be talking. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Was it hard to protect your time with a setup like that? That's why I kept it open. It was Fridays were the only days I would do. Otherwise, my day would be broken up. Yes. You know, people wanting to bring Aunt Clara by or uh, children wanting a little class. Or um, I really I had to become very disciplined in my work. So the children would get off to school and I would be in the studio and then I would break for tennis, uh, tennis tournaments and for dinner. And then when Hal retired, he took over the kitchen and he loves cooking. Oh, thank you, God. That was the blessing, <laughs> I'm so grateful, wasn't it? yes. <laughs> uh, but I wanted to be a family. I wanted to be with my family, but there were many nights I would go back in the studio after the house was quiet and, and work, or I would work early hours in the morning before people were up. Yes. It just depended on my deadlines and also I would solve a problem sometime at two in the morning and go, that's what I need to do. And I would <laughs> yes. go in. The and answers do it. come early in the morning. <laughs> they do. You must be an artist as well. So I just wanted to jump back again. When you got really serious about your work and you decided, I am going to learn anatomy, you went at it in what I think is a really unique way. Yeah. Well, I had three children. I was, I was producing art, but I knew that my missing link was anatomy. And I also would take uh, Pilates early in the morning. And... Uh, one of my teachers was a massage therapist, and we had been talking about anatomy. I had no idea what a certified massage therapist had to go through for anatomy. And I said, uh, would you teach me? And she said, I would love to, because I had my, my whole notebook, which was about this thick. <laughs> and uh, I, I used the... Uh, anatomy coloring book, which nurses and therapists and occupational therapists and physical therapists all have to take. And that's where you're actually coloring the muscles and learning the muscles. So that was my textbook, plus her notes. So it took two years. I had a skeleton that was about 20 inches tall. And we would, each week, we would take a part of the body. It might be one week we'd spend on the hand. And it would be a two-hour session. We'd actually make the muscle out of my clay that I sculpt with. And we would do the attachment and the insertion. So not only was I using the coloring book, I was using all my senses to learn the insertion, origin, and function of every single muscle in the body. And I began to, and then after, um, after a muscle is put on, then you can see why there's, why there's dents in the surface skin and uh, why some people have high cheekbones and you see the muscles once you know those muscles in the bone structure, then when I'm working on the surface, it reflects that knowledge. And it was a huge up difference in my work. Mm -hmm. Huge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I look at some art and I just cringe when a hand is too small. You know, hand is three quarters of a face. You know, and, and you just, or the muscles are, you know, like a leg or an arm looks like a log instead of the full body of the muscle and the insertion and origin parts. Yeah, made a big difference. It paid off. Yeah. <laughs> and then another huge step for you, and I think basically this one was focused on composition, was when you went to Italy. Can you yeah. talk a little bit about your I, I took, um, spent several weeks in Italy 
And we studied, uh, well, Bruno Lucchesi's son, Paul Lucchesi, they're Italian sculptors. He took us uh, to Lucca, to Florence. I mean, we basically would go in chapels and we would go on streets and just study the, the anatomy and also the tricks of the masters. For example, like if they wanted to make a saint or a Christ figure to be accessible to you, very often the foot would overlap, the toes stick out over the base, which says, come to me, I'm accessible, instead of the, the bronze base out here and the sculpture way back here. I learned that males are very angular and females are very S-curves. I learned a lot about drapery, a lot about drapery and when a per uh, and hair, like you don't just put the pieces of hair on, you do it in a body of work and where does the movement go? I learned so much from the master's works. Little things like you would never do a hand like this. A hand would always be three and one or one, two and one. I mean, just the rhythm, the composition, I just can't even tell you. It was like, and I was a sponge, drinking it all up. And I still do. I love to go to museums. I love to see contemporary work and what how they're incorporating. So I love contemporary work. I love Henry Moore's work. I, I love Caravaggio. I love... All so the of whole them, range, the whole spectrum. Mm -hmm. But it all has to do with strong composition mm -hmm. and strong design. And also the finesse things, like about the hands. Um, I don't know. I just love it. <laughs> <laughs> um, you mentioned that... Uh, you know, you, you work with a number of foundries and a couple, you know, fairly steadily. Mm -hmm. uh, and the bronze horse in Pahuska, I guess, being one. It burned to the ground. Right. And that was yeah. in the 90s? That was, or? Uh, yes. No, that was uh, 2015. Mm -hmm. I was... Um, 14. Right, right. I, I used two really wonderful foundries in Loveland, Colorado, which is a mecca okay, yes. of sculpture. Yes. And so those are the ones that you went to after the bronze horse. I, I was the using time. them at the same time. Simultaneously. Mm -hmm. And people don't realize, I think, just the, just the monetary outlay, right? Oh, when you're yeah. working with a foundry. I was very blessed to... Uh, Hal helped me get started, but then once my business started, I would just put all my profits back into casting my next piece, casting my next piece. And I remember when I made the leap from tabletop pieces to, to life-size pieces, I borrowed $10,000 and it was a huge, huge step of faith for me. But that's where things were moving mm -hmm. at that time. And was and this particular, was this a commission or was this just no, your... No, it was a spec piece for my galleries. Gotcha. And um, so I borrowed 10000 and that's what it cost to cast the first bronze. Well, not quite and how, 10. How, how big was this piece? Uh, it was a squatting little boy holding up a frog life-size and man, that sold so fast and more orders. And that that really was the beginning mm -hmm. of me moving into larger works. Mm -hmm. But that put me on the map mm -hmm. for large works. And then World Vision came along in 1995. And I had never done anything bigger than about three or four feet. They loved my work and they knew that I had a, a strong faith and they loved my faces and not then all of a sudden I'm commissioned to do a piece that's 
eight foot tall for the headquarters of World Vision in Washington. It's a incredible, probably the largest uh, relief and development Christian agency in the world. And I thought, I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm going to You've step out of my faith and do it. Monumental Sculpture Commission. Never. Before. And and that was the beginning. And I've done, oh my goodness, I have no idea, 34 monuments now. You know, that was the beginning. And it's probably one of my very best. And I think I did have to rely on God and inspiration and wisdom and just welding the internal pipes with something wow, else. to make your armature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was neat. <laughs> and then little that next Christmas, my husband bought me a welder because I'd been paying a welder to weld for me. I was going to say. And then he became my so. welder. <laughs> oh. He didn't know it, but he became my welder pretty soon after that. <laughs> That's great. Um, and I know from many of your uh, monumental sculptures, you've, you go to the site. That's part of your research. You check out the site and see how it will um, how it will look, and you have that in yeah. mind. Has there ever been? Have you done just sort of a public sculpture or even a monumental sculpture that you didn't specifically plan for the site, but just that just seemed to work perfectly with it? Yeah, actually, I just installed a big piece this last March at. Uh, a very large Baptist church in Shreveport. Um, I had done this piece for another organization and I had carefully, and I never put my monuments in the same state. You know, I just don't. Mm -hmm. um, but I had done this for a specific building in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and this church contacted me. So I checked out the site and it was for a columbarium and they had uh, put this planter, 10 foot diameter planter with flowers in the middle of the columbarium. But um, one of their clients wanted a sculpture. And so I, th I said, this is gonna work beautifully. We only saw it, did it through pictures. And then I went up for the unveiling and it was like, nothing was created so perfectly. The Christ is eight feet tall, and then there was a huge arch window behind him. So it was like if I had had landscape architects, building architects, plus myself, it couldn't have been more perfect. But I, have, I can't even tell you how many times in my life things have worked out beyond what I ever expected. And that's where I feel God's goodness in my career and in my life. I mean, things that I could not possibly have planned, just like this last installation that were so perfect. Yeah. That's a great, great story. Um, you, so you've had quite a few, quite a bit of gallery representation. Can you talk about... Um, how big a portion of your career that has been, uh, if it's maybe accounted for half of your sales or maybe less, mm. and, and just some of the ins and outs of gallery yeah. representation. Gallery representation is all over the map, actually. You know, when I began, I was blessed to have three very top-notch galleries. And I do remember one of them I wanted in that gallery very much. And I remember dressing up and I was doing a show. This was in Sedona. And I went to the gallery. I met the owner and I was shaking in my boots. And I said, you know, I'm showing up at the show up here. And, and he represented a very well-known artist. And I said, I'd really like for you to come up and see my work. And I just remember, and he came up, and he liked my work. And I said, why don't you just try me for six months? And I think I'll do well for you. And I did. And, and so one gallery, I will tell you the Loveland Sculpture Show. Uh, it's, like I said, it's a sculpture mecca. It's highly juried. 
I applied for two years before I got accepted the third year to show. And that really put me on the map because gallery dealers come from all over the country and across the seas to pick up new artists. And uh, for three years in a row, I was their top seller, which was- That's wonderful. Wonderful. But that, that really put me on the map with galleries. And I no longer had to seek out my galleries, they sought me. Mm -hmm. And there's good galleries and there's bad galleries. And you check with other artists to see, do they pay on time? Uh, are they reliable? Are they honest? Do they do well by you? So there's a, that business side. You don't go just with any gallery, you know. And uh, I had only a couple of hiccups in that world. But I would say the galleries are extremely important back then when I was sculpting. Now you have online art galleries. I have my own website now. Mm -hmm. um, I do links to my galleries on my website. Uh, I remember early on, if you had a website, some galleries wouldn't, you either had to be in the gallery or, or have a website. You wouldn't do both, but that's totally changed now, as you know. You know, there's online marketing. Right, right. But for me, my galleries rep me well. <laughs> and um, relationships with collectors. Um, you've had a number of really good collectors in Tulsa, and I know that Walt and Peggy Helmreich were among yes. them. I wonder if you can just talk a little bit about um, that relationship, maybe. And uh, let's start with that. Mm. You know, my collectors are not just to make me famous and make me wealthy. They become good friends and they, they get it. They get my heart. Mm -hmm. They get um, what my message is when I'm working on a piece. And Walt and Peggy Helmrich were wonderful. Uh, they own Utica Square, which has, Walt loves bronzes. And he filled his Utica Square with my bronzes. He would come, see what I was working on. <laughs> what well, can you do it? I remember I was working on a, a girl that holding up grapes, and grapes are pouring out. And Mr. Helmrich's a teetotaler. And he says, I don't want grapes. He says, that's connected with wine. He said, I want you to have a basket of flowers and her holding up a flower. And I said, for you, Walt? I will change it up, but I still want the right to put grapes in there if I want it. And he'd laugh, you know. Uh, they were dear friends, and Peggy's still living. And I did the uh, Peggy Helmrich uh, Library. Yes, it's uh, a wonderful monument piece. piece. And uh, I do. I have collectors all over the country that that love my work and. And, but I've become friends with them. Yes. And now I'm seeing their second generation is inheriting some of my work. And they, I'll get an email and tell me how much they love their pieces now. That's wonderful. Yeah. I mean, it's a whole new thing for me. <laughs> means I'm getting old. <laughs> uh, and commissions. How do you feel about commissions? Um, there is, again, it's a crossroads. Um, some artists want to just do for galleries. And because it takes, at one time I had nine to 12 galleries, but never more than nine repping me at one time. And to keep them supplied with new work is ongoing. So when the economic crashes have come, mm -hmm. I find that's when I started doing commission work because it was paid for. I didn't have to underwrite the pieces on the gallery floor. Yes. It was a done deal. And I thought I would be crazy not to take commissions. And I, so I cut down my number of galleries. I still supplied them, but also they were able to, the only exclusive commission I did uh, is for Cancer Treatment Centers of America. Mm -hmm. And no one can buy that. I mean, it's mm -hmm. only for them. And they have 
six hospitals around the country. So that it was worth it for me to do that, uh, to give them an exclusive. But and World Vision had an exclusive. Mm -hmm. But then I, I did learn that if I placed them in separate states, then it wasn't a problem because I would work months on one piece. And if I had to sell just one, the cost went exorbitantly high. Mm -hmm. But if I was allowed to do an addition of five, then I would recoup my time and my money mm -hmm. on the sales of the others. So for me, commission work was very lucrative and it was very good and it got monumental pieces out there. Mm -hmm. So it was a good, good move on my part for me. You've taught sculpture in a number of settings, yeah. including the Loveland Academy of Arts, Scottsdale, Philbrook Museum. How, how did teaching impact your work? Oh, I think every professional artist should teach. Not every professional artist is a good teacher, but I think I was a good teacher. I love to impart. I love to pull out of my students um, what I see them capable of doing. And for me as an artist, it enhanced my talent because I'm forced to say the principles that I see, like um, design, composition, like um, if you want to elongate a piece, it needs to be uniformly elongated. Um, if you want to exaggerate, I, I begin and it would be things, then am I working on my own work, those things would come back to me or like... You've articulated it. Yes, enough that it ingrained it. And I think teaching is an extremely important part of being a professional artist. Yeah, plus I love teaching. Not everybody loves to teach. Right. And it, it takes time away from your own work. But again, it's like passing on that blazing torch. Mm -hmm. I want the next generation to catch the love and the fire and the passion I have for it. So I love teaching. I'm going to teach in, in uh, Crested Butte in November. Oh, great, great. For the first time in <laughs> several years. Um, so it was around 1999, I think, that maybe you and Hal bought a condo in Crested Butte, as I understand it, and uh -huh. you were just making trips up there part-time. You were still living in Tulsa. So you've had this relationship with the area mm -hmm. for a while. Um, how was how were these trips impacting your sculpting, do you think? I had the blessing of training a wonderful studio assistant. And she could do some of the finishing work for me. Uh, and I knew I wanted to spend some summers. Uh, this is after my business was doing fine. And I would get pieces to where she could sort of finish them off right. while I was in playing in the mountains, <laughs> hiking and playing golf. Which all artists need. And <laughs> just to get away. Yes. And, uh, that worked fine, and she is now doing great commissions on her own. In fact, I just kicked her one this week. That's cool. It yeah. is. She's doing very well on her own. Uh, but it was, there was a time where you, you can get burned out, mm -hmm. you know, and you can lose perspective, mm -hmm. um, and you can lose your health mm -hmm. and your sanity. <laughs> If you, if you don't stay balanced, and Hal was retiring and he was wanting more time with me, and I was ready to let go a little bit more. Right. So, but the mountains, I feel like things have all come at a good time in my life, and I could afford to um, break away a little bit. And so I've done a few pieces since I, quote, retired. Uh, I still am like the show that's coming up, I'm pulling out pieces that I still had one or two additions or I hadn't done the artist proof. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, it's a sort of a retrospective show right. as opposed to all new pieces. Right. Yeah. And, you know, um, we tend to think 
or I you know I used to think that unlike athletes, you know, well, artists can work forever at what they do. Mm-hmm. And it really is not necessarily true. It depends on the medium. Merlin mm-hmm. and I have talked with stone sculptors who, you know, they mm-hmm. can't they can't do that work anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, I was just wondering your thoughts on that because, of course, one remains an artist. Yeah, I did have to think because my identity is tied up with so my art. I think it was that I'm getting older, that I also was having grandchildren that I could not spend time with. I was so ready to to stop the pressure, stop. It's a high pace and it's very demanding physically. I'm getting older, I have arthritis in my hands, in my thumbs. Mm-hmm. And um, it was a conscious decision, but I did hear this echo. Well, who are you going to be if you're not Rosalind the artist? And I thought, I'm going to be Rosalind the grandmother, Rosalind the golfer, Rosalind the hiker, Rosalind the wife. And it was okay because I feel like I gave it my all when I was really working hard in the profession of sculpting. I I reached the top of where I wanted to be and it's okay. And I'm happy. I'm really, really happy in this season of my life. And I'm glad we're doing this interview because I want to encourage those who are beginning to just go for it. Go for it, learn. Don't let anyone tell you you will never make it. Uh, Don't let anyone deter you if it's a passion. But then for the artists who are tired, (laughs) I also (laughs) want to say that you have your own, you have your own body seasons and rhythm and you can still have a fulfilling life when you move into something else. Like now I'm starting to paint more because it's easy and I could pick up a brush and walk out of the, I don't have a studio, I have my upstairs loft. And you know, it's it's more fun. I don't have any gallery representation. I don't have any, I have a few commissions, but nothing to cause me pressure. I don't want any pressure in my life now. I want to coast. Yeah, that was beautifully put. There's a reason, too, that you love bronze and you expressed it a little bit in that Capturing the Spirit, why that medium, uh, why you were so happy to be working in that particular medium. It's the clay that I love because I can move it around. And then when, uh, when I feel like it is saying what I want it to say, it's captured in bronze. And it's going, and and that gives me a huge responsibility. I can't do crappy work. I can't do things that aren't excellent because it's going to be forever in bronze, and it's going to have my name on it. And and I do love bronze because it's outlasts my life, my children's life, and I could never be where I was if it weren't for the bronzes from the 1500s. 1300s, you know, a bronze is a little bit eternal, Mm -hmm. but it also has a huge responsibility for anyone casting in bronze. Yeah. So let's talk about your process and techniques just a little bit. Um, What dictates whether you do like a tabletop sculpture or you do a public sculpture or you do a monumental sculpture? Is it a combination of factors? What, how do you make that decision? Well, when I had nine galleries to supply, they, I would try to do six to nine tabletop pieces and three life-size pieces per year. So that, that, because that was a good balance. Mm -hmm. It was lucrative. Um, But I didn't, I had to be inspired. Like one of my favorite all time pieces is called Breaking Free. And when I hit in my fifties 
there were things in my life that I realized I had broken free from that were had been holding me back before. And so I did this woman spinning in abandon and it's impressionistic, uh, tremendous movement and it's called breaking free. I ended up doing it seven feet as well. But that piece, that is like one of those God inspired pieces because it went, I, I just tell you a few places it went. It went to um, a therapist who works with pa parents whose kids have taken their own lives mm -hmm. and they have been so heavy with guilt. She wanted breaking free to be in their therapy room mm -hmm. because they needed to know what that was like and yeah. make me cry. <laughs> and then a seven foot version of that went to the domestic violence intervention center. Mm -hmm. So that when women who have been in domestic abuse and been downtrodden and beaten and, and hurting can see what it feels like to be set free, breaking mm -hmm. free. That piece probably has had more, and then it was on the cover of a magazine for, not a magazine, but a workbook for women to be a motivation. It's a um, career development motivation. And they put it on the front of their book. And, you know, that piece had such strong messages. Mm -hmm. So, and it speaks strongly, whether it's tabletop or life size. So to answer your question, it was a lucrative decision, a, a balance of life size and tabletop pieces. But every one of them have to be inspired. Right. And tabletop. Uh, find a lot of homes. Yeah, yeah. Can you see these in our interview? Yes, and we'll we'll be oh, positioned we'll too to this. also uh, yeah, just talk now. specifically about them. What is your process for doing a sculpture once you get an idea? What's the process? I start with my armature, and I want to, my armature is just it's like a stick figure in aluminum, so it's very bendable. And like a piece I'm working on now is called the Shawl Dancer, Fancy Shawl Dancer. And it is a dance that's done at powwows by mm -hmm. women. And um, it is just exuberant. So the first thing I did on that was bend the armature so she's exaggerated. Because as you put the clay on and work, it becomes a little bit more static. So the original armature needs to be very exaggerated. And then I start putting the clay on in muscle groups, mm -hmm. like the top of the arm, it's almost like a teardrop. And this is like a teardrop. I carefully measure if I'm going to exaggerate, for example, on women, I exaggerate the femur uh, because it creates more gracefulness. Not not so it's obviously exaggerated, but it, if I'm doing a ballerina, dancer, that's one way I can capture more gracefulness. So then I put the clay on and I stand back and I turn and look at the profile. And then if I want a hand raised or head tilted, I start before I finalize anything, I, I get the motion or emotion captured first. And then I'll finalize it, then take it to the foundry. Or in the instance of a monument, I have mold makers come into the studio and they'll stay in my home mm -hmm. for the week or two that they're making molds. Um, or I take a tabletop to the foundry, they make the molds the mold maker does. Then the mold maker takes the mold to the foundry and the lost wax casting process. Um, I like to always check the first waxes of a new piece to be sure. And I'll usually have a, um, a model cast in wax for my wax workers. So they have it right there and they know, oh, we need to open this eye a little bit, or we need to be sure the skin is smooth, but this Clothing is very textured, so they have a something 
that I have done that they copy. They can refer to. Uh -huh. Or refer to, that's a good one. Um, how do you come up with your titles? Oh, that's fun. Um, I have my title usually before the piece starts and, and um, or early on. I would say every piece has a title early on or before I start because the title sometimes it's whimsical. The title, like I have a piece called Attitude and Altitude and it's a Yama and she's Yamas in Peru and they're pronounced Yamas instead of Lamas if you're speaking Spanish. And they have an attitude. If they don't like something, they spit at you. And so I have her perched on top of a mountain. And I love attitude and altitude because it's a life lesson because your attitude determines your altitude. So that's whimsical. I love that. And it's that's right fine. there, actually. It's right there. <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, like I have a piece caught in the middle of my children. And... Uh, it's it's whimsical and it's fun, but if I kept that caught in the middle, does that mean I'm being pulled both ways? <laughs> and then that's in my mind when I'm creating the piece. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, yeah. And how about signing your pieces? You've been pretty creative on that end too, I think. Oh yeah. If if I have a model, which I use a lot of models. Usually neighborhood kids or my uh, godchild was a model for several of my pieces. They get to sign like underneath the skirt or they'll put their thumbprint in there. Um, I did a huge piece for um, this uh, for the Arts and Humanities Council. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> the woman, you better stop here. I, got, I have a brain snap here. Just a second. So we were talking about your sculpture at Hart Weldon. Yeah, so I did a piece for the Arts and Humanities Council, and it was underwritten by the Grand Dame of Art in Tulsa, who is now in heaven, but she had Parkinson's disease, and she wanted to underwrite this, so she would be wheeled into my studio by her caretaker, and she would watch it, and so it was finally ready for the boundary to have the molds made, and it's a dancing minstrel, and he has this these little balls on the tip of his toes while he's dancing on the shoes. And I said, Katie, why don't you come put your thumbprint in the ball of his upraised shoe? And so they wheeled her in. We helped her stand up. She pressed her thumbprint in there. <laughs> she was thrilled to death. And I thought about that because of Thomas Moran used to sign, you know, Thomas Moran, the great uh, painter, would put a uh, dip his thumb in black paint and put it on his paintings and then sign them. I didn't so, realize that. Yeah. <laughs> that was thought, a great and idea. She loved it. She loved it. <laughs> yeah. So it was there. Her thumbprints there in bronze. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, as you look back on your sculpting career, what's been one of the high points? Oh, there have been so many. I think. Uh, one of the highest points, and it was a huge turning point in my career, was the installation of the headquarter piece for World Vision. We had uh, dignitaries coming from all over the world, and I spoke in front of so many people that day. And, and I flew my parents in, and my daddy, who used to say, you better major in something besides art. You'll never be able to support yourself. And, you know, my dad just laughed about that because, <laughs> you know, here they were. Uh, that was a high point because it was a huge leap for me moving. And it was a magnificent piece. It still is. Because as you walk into the face, in, walk into the World Vision building, you're looking into the face of Christ. But as you come out of the building, you're looking into the faces of all the children of the different nations. And that's symbolic. Yeah. Yeah. That was, <laughs> I, I've had several high points, but I would say that was the highest because my dad was living to see yeah. my success. What was one of the low points? Mm. 
low point, and this probably is a lesson for any sculptor, any artist, I got overloaded with commissions, with gallery demands, with show demands. And uh, I remember I wasn't sleeping well, I was crying easily. And I went, you know, for my little physical, and I told my sweet doctor who I loved, I said, you know, I'm just not sleeping well. I'm, you know, cry easily. And she said, Rosalind, you're depressed. And I went, I'm not depressed. I can't, I don't get depressed. And it was just because I was overloaded. And she loved me enough to say, sweet girl, you need to either uh, you need to look at that you can't, your body can't continue to take this emotionally or physically, and you need to unload a little bit. And I had to make some decisions, uh, let go of some things. I, can't, I couldn't be all people, all things to all people. I couldn't meet all the demands, so I needed to learn to say no. Hal says, I need a sticky note by every phone that has the letter N-O on it. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think that, I think in any business, you can become so enraptured with your success and also your desire to please people that you can get out of balance. And that, that was a scary time for me, you know, because I didn't want to take any depressants. Mm -hmm. um, and then once I changed my life, and it took me about two years to reschedule and learn to say no and learn to say, I'll get back with you on this and give it some thought um, to where I, I felt everyone was wanting a piece of me and there wasn't anything left of me, you know? So that was a low point. Well, we're getting ready to look at your individual sculptures uh, just quickly that, you, that uh, uh, are here at your daughter's house. Is there anything we haven't talked about that you would like to add? Hmm. No, it's been a great interview. I think you've covered everything. I actually do. Well, we're going to pause a minute and take a look at these sculptures. Okay. Okay, Rosalind, we're looking at the llama piece that you did. Yes. This is called Attitude and Altitude. And the uh, Growing up in Peru, the, the llamas, we call them llamas in Spanish, two L's are pronounced like a Y, um, they were just grazing on the mountainside. They were also used for pack animals. If you, if you put more than 70 pounds on their back, they would spit at you and they wouldn't behave. And so they do have an attitude. And so I've got her very feisty and proud uh, sitting on top of a mountain and um, it came to me that our attitude determines our altitude. And so I call that my life lesson piece. Your attitude determines your altitude. Wonderful. Yeah. Yes. This piece is, uh, this is one of my early pieces that my daughter has. It's totally sold out. Um, it's called the Fiesta. And um, I think this was one of my first pieces to capture movement, and I think that's probably put me on the map, movement and faces, but you can see she's dancing in joy and abandon, and in Peru, um, the more petticoats a woman had, the higher her stance was in the community, so this woman has <laughs> she a lot, has several. <laughs> yeah, she is, uh, she's well thought of in the community. But I also love the, the movement. Yes. You can capture in bronze. It's beautiful. And this piece on the mantle? Yeah. This is a sculpture I did of my father while he was still alive. He was a rancher, as I said, and uh, he had this horse called Pat. When he went off to World War II, he was gone for three years and he came back and he would cry when he'd tell the story that he would whistle he came back after three years and whistled, and Pack heard him and came running through the pasture. Aww. He has his horse brand on his rear, and my dad had a broken nose. He played football for Texas A&M in 1933, 
got his nose busted, so he's got his crooked nose, and he always wore his Stetson cocked on the side a little bit. <laughs> so that's my dad, and I didn't ever do an edition for sale. This was only for the children and the grandchildren, that's and then I broke the mold. That's special. Yeah. So many of my pieces um, come from life experiences, and here's my daughter who was always hauling her little brother off to do adventures, <laughs> and he had this blanket he wouldn't let go of, and this is our old dog Josh, who lived to be 16, and so I thought how clever that is, caught in the middle, because Clint would go running through the house, the dog would be on his blanket, and Amy was hauling him to do adventures. So that's uh, it, it, this piece sold so well. And again, you can see how I put this foot way off of the base and it creates this yes. thrusting forward. Yes, as well as inviting you. <laughs> yeah, and the dog's tail brings energy back into the piece. And if you fo followed her toe and hands, would come, the energy would come back into the piece. Oh, it's a wonderful so, piece. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Rosalind. Oh, I loved it. I have Julie. You're, you're a great interview. You asked me great questions.